lectures that I've missed. So I'm going to cover back on food fermentation. And hopefully I can finish food fermentation in one hour, and then we're going to settle uh, single cell protein in another hour. Now, if you have any questions, any queries, we'll do it at the end of the lecture. Most probably um, the next half an hour. Okay, the last half an hour. So right now we will just go through a lecture. Now the reason why I want to touch about food fermentation is because I think you need to know about fermentation before we can actually go into single cell protein and later on we're going to talk about enzymes. If you do not have the basis for fermentation itself, then you may have problems understanding it later. And I don't know if you're reading on your own, even if you're asking me questions and discussion, I don't know how much you know. So it's better that I cover it. So food fermentation as an introduction. Now let's compare fermentation with respiration. Everyone knows respiration is what we go through every day, right? We are breathing. Now fermentation is a little bit different from respiration. Now just for a comparison, respiration we need oxygen. Fermentation most of the time we don't. Uh, they are selective cases, but we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about the general trend. Now. If we look at respiration, we will be looking at the Krebs cycle and we will be looking at electrons transfer. I hope you still remember basic biology, the one you did in, in uh, pre-unit courses. So for fermentation, we do not go through all this. We don't need a Krebs cycle. We don't have electron transfer. But despite not having electron transfer, it doesn't mean there is no energy transfer. There is still energy transfer in terms of uh, our ATPs, okay? So it produces only very small amount of energy, ATP. So one or two molecules from each starting material. Now what we mean by starting material is the fermentation substrate. And in most cases, fermentation substrates will be sugars. Now before we go on into fermentation, I want to also introduce you to two terms, catabolism and anabolism. I hope you still remember this. Well, catabolism is actually, in simpler terms, the process of breaking things. Anabolism is the opposite. It's the process of building things. So fermentation involves both catabolism and anabolism. Now, catabolism, very frequently we have complex molecules, starch, polysaccharides, lipids. Now, during the hydrolysis of breaking processes, it will also release some heat. And what is generated? Simple molecules, polysaccharides, hydrolyzed to sugars, proteins, hydrolyzed to peptides or amino acids, fats, hydrolyzed maybe to fatty acids. So for fermentation, catabolism is very important because in most instances, cells cannot completely digest all the big molecules, macromolecules. They have to hydrolyze that first to smaller molecules, then they use the smaller molecules for something else. So they do go through catabolism. After that, anabolism will take place. Oh, so catabolism uh, involves the production of energy in terms of ATP. Now, anabolism is the process of building something. So if we need to build something, we need to have energy. So the energy that was released from catabolism will actually be used by anabolic processes to actually build back complex structures. Now, why would we need to build complex structures? All cells have basically the same function. They need to live. They need to have activities. Just like any living matters, just like human beings, we need to live, we need to have activities. So we need the energy. Now they need the energy to convert all these small molecules. May it be fatty acids, peptides, amino acids, or simple sugars. They need it for their living processes to generate uh, structures for their cell membrane, for example, to generate activities so that they can produce metabolites. Metabolites are the byproducts of the fermentation. Okay? So that is the anabolic processes. And from here, heat is also released. So for fermentation, I hope you understand the concept. It generates ATP. It does involve catabolism, anabolism. So both ATP that are generated can be reused for cell activities. Okay, you, I hope that you are clear for that. Now, fermentation in food can occur very naturally. If we have, let's say, nasi lemak in an open air condition, 
and assuming there's contamination, which means there are other cells that actually contaminated our food. Fermentation will also take place because those cells, whatever, it can be bacteria or fungal, they can leave on our food, taking food matrix as a substrate, and they will release metabolite. And very frequently, their metabolite will cause undesired properties in food fermentation. So when we talk about food fermentation, even in your presentation, you will be talking about all the good aspects, right? I hope you will cover some bad aspects too. What happens if your food products are contaminated? Because all your foods will be different. You will have very different metrics. And obviously, the contamination and the end product of the fermentation, will that be the same? Will it be the same for each different food product and food metrics? No, it won't be. So I hope you can cover some prospects, not prospects, some possibilities. If contamination happened to your food product, fermentation happens, what happened to your food product? Now let's look at some example. Vinegar and wine. Wine is an alcoholic beverage, but vinegar can also be present. Later on, when I talk about food fermentation, you will see that in order to produce um, vinegary substances, such as acetic acid, you know vinegar? Basically, acetic acid. Acetic acid can be produced from alcohol. So wine has abundant alcohol content. So certain microorganisms can use that alcohol to turn it to vinegar. So do you, do you want wine with vinegar? No. That would be an undesired property. Then we talk about proteolysis, the breakdown of proteins. Now breaking down of proteins later, as we cover in single cell protein, we will be looking at all the different profiles of different amino acids. That will be an interesting topic. So proteolysis produce peptides, produce amino acids, and what happens to the amino acids? Some of them are bitter. You don't want those things to occur in your foods. Then lipolysis, the breakdown of lipids. Have you heard of lipid oxidation? Yes. Now long chain lipid, especially the very saturated one, are less prone to lipolysis. Those unsaturated ones are very prone to lipolysis. And if we were to chop off longer chains of fats and lipids to shorter chains of fatty acids, it will generate even more higher probability of lipolysis. Now that will actually contribute to a lot of lipid oxidation. So we don't want that because food, especially fatty foods, will become rancid. You know rancid? Okay. Now toxins, of course. Some microorganisms produce toxin during fermentation. Now toxin, as covered by the first lecture on uh, different types of microorganisms, the difference between uh, bacteria and pathogens, right? Not all bacteria are pathogens. Some are just food spoilage bacteria. They spoil the food. You can see it. Your food structure change. There are other bacteria that do not cause structural changes. They quietly live inside, produce toxin, and we don't even see the bacteria, but when we consume that food, the toxin will actually have intoxication effects on us. So that is actually a very problematic, a huge issue in food technology and also food fields. Then we have odd colors, of course. When we have fermented food, different products are degraded, and depending on the products, some of it are more prone to enzyme activities. Let's look at orange juice, not orange juice, apple juice, for example. What happened to your apple juice immediately after blending? Green in color. You leave it forgotten to drink about that for another half an hour. What happens to your apple juice? It turns to brown. Does that mean your apple juice is spoiled? No. Your apple juice is not spoiled. Well, at that moment, I hope, not spoiled, not microbially spoiled. But what it means is that enzyme activities occur and it changes the color from green to brown. So we have a browning effect. Now, how come that does not happen in the original apple fruit? Yes, there's a skin layer, it's protected. So enzyme activities is less because enzyme could not penetrate. Uh, not, not enzyme could not penetrate, oxygen could not penetrate, and enzymes inside the apple could not react uh, uh, openly. But if you blend the apple, apple juices explode, enzymes inside are explode, and upon presence of oxygen, they react. So browning activities occur. 
So all these odd colors will also occur for fermentation. Then odd odors. Now this is very common for food spoilage. Once you smell something funny, you know your food is spoiled, right? Off flavors. Off flavors can happen in various types of categories. Off flavors can happen because of the production of different metabolites, right? If too much acids are produced, obviously your food will be will taste sourish. So that's one type of off flavor. Another type of off flavor is because of fermentation. So a lot of other um, larger molecules are hydrolyzed, right? To smaller molecules. Now these smaller molecules can also react among themselves and form new substances. So that will also cause off flavors. So many categories that can occur. Now these are what we call the undesired properties. We don't want that to happen during food fermentation. That is why we try to control food fermentation. So we're going to look at some challenges later. Now, what are the purposes of food fermentation? So fermentation in food can cause food spoilage, but that is not what we want. What we want are these. We want to preserve food, food preservation, right? Which is why we have sauerkraut, we have pickles. Those are very long shelf life foods and those are fermented foods, just like kimchi. You can keep for ages. Acid production and very often fermentation produces acid. So acid actually lowers the pH. And once pH are lowered, a lot of microorganisms cannot live in there because it's too acidic for them. Okay? And then reduction of energy. So um, catabolism, anabolism happens. So energy transfer happens. Yes cycle. Now, increase nutrient density. Fermentation actually does increase nutrient density. That is because all these larger macromolecules, what happens to them is that once they are hydrolyzed, they become a pool of large, a large pool of smaller molecules. And these are actually nutrients to our microorganisms, but may it be bacteria or fungus. So complex nutrients are turned into simpler ones. And they can also break, break down plant structures, just like kimchi and sauerkraut. The original structure of the plant has been changed throughout fermentation. We're going to look at that later. Synthesize vitamins. Some microorganisms during fermentation, they produce vitamins. Actually, not just vitamins. They can also produce some micro elements, micro minerals. Okay, so that kind of things can happen. Now, in food fermentation, there are three very huge categories of food fermentation. The acids and the alcohol. And the acids, we have lactic acid, we have acetic acid. But does that mean that these are the only three types of food fermentation? No. Later, I will touch on a few more smaller categories. But the larger ones are these. And the acids one are the largest because that's what we want. We want acids to preserve food. Now, lactic acid fermentation will also be separated into two, homofermentation and heterofermentation. We're going to look at that later, okay? Now, lactic acid fermentation. Now, before lactic acid fermentation could occur, we will have the process called glycolysis. Any idea what glycolysis means? Breakdown of glucose. Yes, breakdown of glucose. Now, bear in mind, that um, yes, for fermentation, we use glucose as a model because glucose is the simplest sugar that can be utilized by most cells, I would say, fungus or bacteria or yeast. Most cells can utilize glucose. But can glucose appear in the food matrix freely? No. Sometimes yes, most of the time no. Most of the time it will come from other complex polysaccharides. And there will be other microorganisms that can actually hydrolyze that complex uh, polysaccharide and turn that into simpler sugars, such as glucose. Now, one molecule of glucose during glycolysis is broken into half, broken into two molecules, making two molecules of pyruvic acid. Now, this process is anaerobic. We do not need oxygen. But glycolysis uh, releases energy. Uh, but before it can actually release energy, it needs energy. It needs actually two moles of ATPs. And after the end of glycolysis, it releases four moles of ATP. So the net reaction ATP is actually only two moles of ATP. Now let's look at the um, 
thing. Okay, now if there is no oxygen present after glycolysis, fermentation occurs. So glycolysis happens first. So those microorganisms should have the, the uh, enzymes to actually break down glucose and so on. Now after that, from pyruvate or pyruvic acid, what happens? Sugar is converted almost entirely to lactic acid during lactic acid fermentation. So in many cells, pyruv uh, pyruvic acid will actually accumulate in the cells, but they can actually be converted into lactic acid later as well. So let's look at uh, the uh, reaction. Now one mole of glucose actually separated into two moles of pyruvic acid. And as you can see, they, they initially need two moles of ATP, but they also release four moles of ATP. So the net, net molecules of ATP is only two moles. Now, from pyruvic acid, different types of reaction can occur. Pyruvic acid is actually the base for a lot of reactions. Now, two of the main one is lactic acid and the other one is alcohol. So we're just going to look at lactic acid. So from two moles of pyruvic acid, we will also have another two moles of lactic acid. So for homo fermentation, which means no, nothing else are produced, only lactic acid are produced, one mole of glucose produces two moles of lactic acid. Okay? We're going to look at heterofermentation later. Now, let's look at pyruvic acid as a model, as I've mentioned just now. Depending on different microorganisms, lactic acid bacteria, what we call LAB, from the name lactic acid bacteria, you know they produce lactic acid. So this lactic acid bacteria will produce lactic acid from pyruvic acid. And there are, for example, streptococcus, lactobacillus, lactoco uh, uh, lactococci, leuconostoc, and so on. But if we look at yeast, saccharomyces, they would not turn that into lactic acid. They would turn pyruvic or pyruvic acid into alcohol and carbon dioxide. If you look at propione bacterium, from the name propione bacterium, you know they produce propionic acid. So they all come from pyruvic acid, and Clostridium, uh, Escherichia, Salmonella, Enterobacter. So all these will have a different profile of different metabolites. Now these are what we call metabolites, the products from cells. Okay. So bear in mind, glucose forming pyruvic acid Pyruvic acid not necessarily have to form lactic acid. It can form many other things, depending on what cells we are using, what microorganisms are involved. Now this is why we call fermentation can sometimes be controlled. We can select the microorganism. We can control the end product. Now homolactic fermentation produces lactic acid only. Hetero fermentation, as you can see the word hetero, it means it produces more than just lactic acid. It can produce other things. Now, for lactic acid bacteria, under hetero uh, fermentation conditions, they will produce lactic acid, they will also produce acetic acid, and they will produce carbon dioxide. Also, again, depending on microorganism, it can produce some other things other than acetic acid and carbon dioxide. Okay? But what I want to stress here is that it produces lactic acid and other compounds. So this is homofermentation. As you can see, one glucose, two lactic acid. Let's look at the application. Yogurt, we need that. If our yogurt tastes vinegary, tastes acetic acid, uh, it may, in certain communities, it may, it may be undesired. Certain people may like it. Certain people may not. So cer certain communities may not, may not like it. Cheese. Cheese also has lactic acid, which is why certain cheese you can actually taste, sourish taste. And uh, if you're involved in sensory evaluations, food students maybe, try using cheese as a sample. Try to figure out what are inside cheese, what sensory properties you manage to, de to detect from cheeses, okay? Butter and sausages. Then we look at hetero fermentation, like I've said, one mole of glucose forming one mole of uh, lactic acid one mole of ethanol, and one mole of carbon dioxide. So at the same time, of course, it produces ATP. And depending on microorganism, again, very frequently lactic acid bacteria also produce acetic acid. So application, kefir. Kefir is a Middle Eastern cheese. Am I right? Middle Eastern cheese. 
Try it. Try talk. We have a lot of uh, Middle Eastern friends around us. Try talk to them. They they might produce cafe in their own home. Okay. Now next we're going to talk about acetic acid fermentation. So the biggest fermentation, just one of the biggest, largest, is lactic acid because dairy industries are large, huge. Yogurt, cheeses, fermented uh, milk drinks. Those are dairy, and those involve lactic acid. Acetic acid is also huge because acetic acid industries involve vinegar. And if you think that vinegar only involves for your cooking, that is very wrong. Later, I will show some example of vinegary foods. Okay. Now, acetic acid obviously will not be produced mainly by lactic acid bacteria. It will be produced mainly by acetic acid bacteria. And one example of acetic acid bacteria is acetobacter. So acetobacter will actually convert ethanol to acetic acid. So you see now the main substrate is alcohol. So if you have acetobacter contamination in alcoholic uh, beverages maybe, uh, this can happen and you can end up having vinegary taste or acetic acid taste in your alcoholic beverage. Okay? Now, it can make from almost any fruits for the initial substrate fermentation because they still need sugar, simple sugars to start off the fermentation. And then it contains at least four grams of acetate per 100 ml of uh, substrates. But look at the condition. Optimum condition for acetobacter to convert to acetic acid is uh, to convert the uh, alcohol to acetic acid is at roughly 20 degrees C and also at a very low pH. So this happens at very cold conditions, not open air in Malaysia at 30, 32 degrees. So it's an oxidative fermentation. Oxidative means oxygen is involved. Ethanol is actually oxidized uh, with air, with oxygen, to acetic acid and water. And what is involved? Acetobacter. Now let's look at the uh, reaction. Sugar, like what we have mentioned just now, to uh, glucose, for example, to pyruvic acid, acid, then later to ethanol. Okay, so this part we bypass. Now, let's start from here. Alcohol. Alcohol will be converted to acetic acid. Now let's look at this uh, acetic acid bacteria, acetobacter. We have different, different types, even acidomonas. So one mole of ethanol, one mole of acetic acid. Now let's look at different types of vinegar. As I've mentioned, if we think about the vinegar that we use in our cooking, well, that's just one type. There are also other types of vinegary drinks, vinegary beverage that can be produced. One is uh, wine vinegar from grape wine. Cider vinegar, we call apple cider from apple. Malt vinegar from barley, rice vinegar from rice. So rice vinegar is a little bit complex because rice, a huge chains a huge chain of polysaccharide will first have to be hydrolyzed first before converted to sugars, right? Sugars then later on to pyruvic acid, acid later on to alcohol, and alcohol later on to acetic acid. So it's a longer process. So we have sugar vinegar, we have whey vinegar, we have fruit vinegar. I'm very sure if you go to the hypermarket today, look in the uh, vinegar section, you will see. I think apple cider vinegar is one of the most common ones. And you can actually buy that, dilute that with water and drink that. Right? Now, uh, for the fermentation of acetic acid to occur, there are certain requirements. Nutrients, let's look at some nutrients and water requirement. Well, usually if they don't need additional nutrient. Just the substrate, if it comes from fruit, fruit products, that would, be, that would be great. But ammonium phosphate sometimes is added. Uh, water free from chlorine, we don't want to kill the microorganism. Additional nutrients can sometimes be added to speed up the fermentation to add nutrients also to the final end food products. So sometimes we may be able to see fruit uh, vinegar with added maybe vitamin B or added uh, antioxidant properties. So there are some vitamin E added inside, okay? Those are additional elements added. Now let's look at during fermentation, what happens to the microorganism? Now I hope that for your assignment, you will also cover that. You, not you do not just show what happened in your process. You have a 40-minute presentation. First, start with your um, 
crowdsourcing data, right? Some of you came to see me, to ask me, can I do this product, can I do that product? I appreciate you coming to see me. Thank you. But I would have another question. Why do you need to ask me whether you can do this product or do that product or not? Shouldn't you get that from your crowdsourcing data? If I tell you, yes, you can, you can present on Tempeh, but from your crowdsourcing data, Tempeh is not that desired. Are you still going to present on Tempeh? So if you come to see me to ask me whether can you present on this product or that product, show me your crowdsourcing data. Okay? I hope you would have done your crowdsourcing data. Then show me. Then we talk about that. Okay? Don't just come and say, can I do this product, this product, or Tempeh in cereal? Crowdsourcing data. Okay? Show me. Now, back to this, back to your presentation. So, you have got your crowdsourcing data, you have confirmed on your product, then you're going to do your presentation on your product's fermentation. So, how are you going to do that? Are you just going to tell me, oh, I want to produce this product. I'm going to have this microorganism, and this is what happened during fermentation. How many moles of oxygen being produced, how many moles of metabolite being produced. Yes, you should tell that, but on the other hand, you should also tell me or present to, to, to us what happens during fermentation. Now let's look at acidic acid fermentation as an example. Now lack of oxygen, uh, the conversion of ethanol to acetic acid has to happen in the presence of oxygen, right? It's an aerobic process. So if there is lack of oxygen it, throughout the process, What's going to happen to Acetobacter, the microorganism? Well, it can have significant cell damage. And due to that, the reaction may not occur in a desired manner. And thus, vinegar may not be produced at a high concentration. So your process is not optimum. So these are the kind of situation that you will have to explain during fermentation of your product. Another one, lack of ethanol. It can cause severe damage to the cells. Well, actually, in many instances, too high concentration of ethanol can also have damages to the cells. So we have always got to adjust. We have got to know what is the optimum concentration of ethanol needed by acetobacter before we can convert that into acetic acid. If we give it a too low concentration or too high concentration, the cells are not going to live well. So it is not going to produce acetic acid well. So same for your product presentation. You can tell me your substrate is maybe lactic acid and you convert lactic acid into something else. But too much lactic acid can also inhibit cellular growth, right? So that, that are the kind of parameters that you will have to present on, okay? So Drew, for your presentation, it's 20%, it's 40 minutes. Think thoroughly what to present. Think from all angles, okay? Now, another thing is changes in temperature. Now, if temperature were to be circulated or modified too quickly, drastic changes of temperature, cells also could not cope. Very similar to all living matters, including human. If we were to shift to another place, fluctuation of temperature or changes of temperature is too drastic, we will also have problem adjusting. Same with cells. They will also have problems adjusting. Optimum for acetic acid just now, as I've mentioned, 20 degrees C. Put this bacteria in 60 degrees C. They would most probably have cell damage. Those who do not have cell damage will need a longer time to adapt. And most probably they will not convert ethanol to acetic acid. They will just survive and live. Will not produce metabolite. And over oxidation, yes, we need oxygen for the process, am I right? Too much oxygen, what happens? Undesired oxidation to carbon dioxide. So we, you will have too much carbon dioxide during fermentation. So that all these will actually affect growth rate, affect production of metabolite. And in this case, the metabolite is acetic acid. Okay, we're gonna talk about alcohol fermentation next. Now, for lactic acid fermentation, bacteria, mostly bacteria is involved, lactic acid bacteria. Acidic acid fermentation, and most of the time, is acidic acid bacteria. For alcohol fermentation, most of the time, it's yeast. Uh, some, certain microorganisms can also produce alcohol, but 
the biggest um, producers in terms of food industries will be from yeast. Okay? Now, yeast actually convert sugars to ethanol. Now, let's look at this. This is a cartoon. Barley converted to malt. Uh, then we also have cornstarch. Now, all these are polysaccharide sources, right? Converted to simpler glucose through different stages of hydrolysis. After that, after that addition of yeast, and we're going to have fermentation occurring, and then end product is ethanol. Now, it's uh, an anaerobic fermentation. So yeast, under aerobic condition, most of the time will not produce ethanol. We will have to induce the environment, induce the condition for the fermentation, to, for it to be under anaerobic condition, most probably flushing with carbon dioxide and things like that in the fermenter, to give it an anaerobic condition. Then yeast will convert sugars to ethanol. And during that, it also produces carbon dioxide. Now, what is ethyl alcohol? I hope you still remember your basic biochem. Ethyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol? Yes, ethyl alcohol is ethanol. <laughs> okay, now, during... Many of us will see this, but we don't realize this happening. Now, let's look at this photo. What happens there? We have dough. Yes? Dough will rise because we add uh, yeast inside. And inside the dough, it can be uh, uh, a little bit anaerobic, a little bit. Because of that, during dough fermentation, alcohol is actually produced. But that doesn't matter because when we're baking the uh, bread later, alcohol is evaporated, so that, that's okay. Now, do you, do you expect that you just put the yeast inside and then the dough will rise immediately. Yes, sometimes, sometimes it happens if we have very, very active yeast. But most of the time it won't. We have to wait. We have to wait for some time. Because we have to wait for the yeast to utilize the substrate in the dough, in the starch, in the sh uh, as sugars, as substrate. Then they start to produce carbon dioxide and also uh, ethanol. That gas, the carbon dioxide gas, will actually cause dough to rise. So we see this from time to time. We just don't realize that. And this is also a very minute case of alcohol fermentation because alcohol actually causes, uh, uh, it's a byproduct during this fermentation. But we don't worry too much about bread because during, like I said, during baking process, ethanol is evaporated, okay? Now let's look at alcohol fermentation. We have one mole of glucose and it will actually form two more of ethanol and also uh, I believe one more of carbon dioxide. Now let's look at the application, wine, beer, vodka, those are all the normal uh, bev uh, ethanolic, alcoholic beverages. Of course, bread is also on the list, but we don't want alcohol in bread. Okay, we have two examples here. One is sauerkraut and one is wine. I don't want to touch on these two examples, as I believe you can read on your own. But one thing that I want to highlight for sauerkraut fermentation is this. Okay, you, this is the uh, process. Okay, now in most food fermentation, do you think that only one reaction would occur? Or should I say one stage of reaction will occur? No. I would say in all instances, there will be multiple stages of fermentation. So for your project or your presentation, you will also touch on the multiple stages because I don't believe that for a food matrix, only one stage of fermentation can occur. Now one example here is sauerkraut. So sauerkraut will have multiple stages. Now let's look at the first stage. It is initiated by leuconostol. Then the second stage is done by all the lactobacillus or pediococcus. So what happened is this. Now what happens in leuconostoc is that leuconostoc first dominated sauerkraut fermentation. Now during that it produced a gas, it grows rapidly, it produced lactic acid, acetic acid, uh, and because of all these acids being produced, it reduces the pH. And once it reduces the pH, a lot of microorganisms that are not acidic tolerant will not be able to live. So it kind of 
eliminated a lot of microorganisms. Competitively, it competes with them, and they lose out. Leuconostoc wins. Leuconostoc continues to grow, and as it continues to produce acid, it creates an acidic environment. Who can live, or what microorganisms can live in an acidic environment? Now, this is an incidental microorganism, sometimes coliform, and pseudomonas can occur, but that, that is a, a different story. Now, after that, because of the acidic environment, not many microorganisms can, can live. So once leuconostoc has done its job, lactobacillus microorganisms, lactobacilli and microorganisms will take over. It will be the next stage of fermentation, next stage of dominant microorganism. And here, it will continue fermentation, and it will produce this kind of uh, end products. Now, these are the, the uh, metabolites, the end products that actually contribute to the final taste of sauerkraut, okay? So I won't talk too much on that. You can read on your own. And the other good example is wine. And we have white wine, we have red wine, we have sparkling wine. And you will notice that for white wine and red wine, we will be talking about uh, different fermentation conditions, different substrates, type, different types of substrate, okay? So, so read on that. So I won't cover this. This is wine. Now, I'm going to talk about other food fermentations. Now, for food fermentation, as I've mentioned just now, three main categories, the lactic acid, acidic acid, and alcohol. But that does not mean that we only have three types of food fermentation. There are other types of food fermentation. Now, of course, it's sugar, uh, fermentation, energy production, acid, and carbon dioxide. Now, let's look at protein fermentation. So the substrate now is no longer sugars or polysaccharides. The substrate now is proteins. So certain microorganisms convert proteins to peptides, to amino acid, and they, they will have a wide range of different flavors altogether. And one good example of changing in flavor is soybean fermentation. It can be natto, it can be tempeh, but at the end of the day, the proteins inside are hydrolyzed into peptides, amino acids, that contribute to the uh, very unique taste, unique organoleptic properties, flavors, taste, of tempeh and also natto. And then we have diacetyl production that is very common for buttermilk, sour cream. Diacetyl is also produced by uh, certain strains of lactic acid bacteria. Then we have propionic acid fermentation. Remember all the propionyl bacterium producing propionyl acid. And that is very common for certain cheese. Now, protein fermentation. This is the link that I was telling you about. How many of you have actually read this article? Yes, good. Read that. Which means downloadable, right? Still could download, right? From the link. Okay, if the link is already missing or something, let me know. I have the PDF on. But I read that interesting article, and if you read that, you will get certain tips on what you should concentrate on when you talk. This is on Nigerian legumes. So legumes are very high, high in protein contents. And during fermentation of the legumes, what happens? So proteins are being hydrolyzed to what? And what happens to the final product? And does that mean only, prote uh, only proteins are involved? No. In this paper, it will also cover some carbohydrates, some lipids. So that, in all, changes the organoleptic properties of the Nigerian legumes. So I want you to, to read on that and think about what you should do with your own presentation. At the end of the day, it is not, it is not very, very crucial on what your product is, but how you present it, what information you gather from it. If you, for example, you take a very common one like tempeh, if you can actually present it very well, what happens throughout fermentation inside tempeh, as what happens with the Nigerian legumes, then I would say you would have done a very good job, right? So the most important thing is you understand fermentation, food bioprocess. Okay, then we also have citric fermentation. Now, several species of LAB can actually ferment citrate to produce diacetyl. So now, the uh, substrate is citrate. 
and from there we produce diacetyl. Now diacetyl will also contribute to some organoleptic properties of certain foods, such as sour cream. So sour cream, not just sourish, it also has a very distinct um, organoleptic property. You can actually uh, smell it, taste it. So that is because from diacetyl. And then we have propionic uh, fermentation. So propionyl bacterium actually um, produces not producers, one of the main players in the production of these kind of cheeses, Swiss type cheese manufacturing. So I'm sure you would know, different cheese, different types of cheese have different flavor, different, not just flavor, different smell, texture, yes, organoleptic properties, all are different because of the different microorganisms that are involved, okay? So all these are contributed by that. Now, some strains can ferment lactose. Now, Lactose is not a simple sugar. It is not a simple sugar like glucose, where most microorganisms can utilize that. Strains that can ferment lactose need this enzyme called beta-galactosidase. If they do not have beta-galactosidase, they would not be able to utilize lactose. And um, one of the common names of beta-galactosidase is lactase. Now, in, even in humans, not all of us have lactase. Not all of us, not all of our intestines can produce lactase. So those people who cannot produce lactase will have what we call lactose intolerance. Most of the time, we'll have a lot of problems consuming milk products, uh, maybe crude milk, okay? Fermented milk is okay. For example, yogurt. Many people who are lactose intolerant cannot drink milk but they can tolerate uh, yogurt. Now, what happens to these people who cannot tolerate lactose? When we drink milk, there's a lot of uh, lactose in milk. Lactose is one of the primary sugars in milk. So we, for those of us who are more lucky, intestines can produce lactase or beta-galactosidase. We will digest lactose, and lactose will be gone, hydrolyzed. If we cannot digest lactose, Lactose will remain undigested, arrive at the intestines, and uh, they will be fermented by other microorganisms that can ferment lactose and produce uh, carbon dioxide sometimes, produce certain acids. And what happens is that acids causes uh, alteration in bowel movement. Carbon dioxide causes <coughs> gas what we call flatulence. So sometimes people with lactose intolerance will have bloating problems, then they will have diarrhea because of bowel movement. So most of the time, uh, these people, lactose intolerant people, they will have to eat lactase before they eat milk products, okay? So a little bit inconvenient, but it's not, not, not that bad currently with the current technology. There are lactase available. Okay, now coming back to yogurt, why is it that they can tolerate yogurt? Because yogurt is fermented food, right? Yogurt is fermented by lactic acid bacteria. Lactic acid bacteria has the enzyme alpha-galactosidase and can hydrolyze lactose. So lactose, so they use lactose to grow, they use lactose uh, to produce metabolite lactic acid. So acid produced in milk causes milk protein to curd, right? So that's why yogurt has a different texture than milk. So once they use lactose to live as a substrate, what happens to the concentration of lactose in milk? Reduced, it will be reduced. So which is why a lot of lactose intolerant subjects or people, they can consume uh, fermented milk products. It can be fermented milk drink or fermented uh, milk product like yogurt, but they cannot tolerate crude milk, all right? So only some strains can ferment lactose, not all, because not all would have lactase or bet, uh, uh, beta-galactosidase or alpha-galactosidase, but depleted when they get the chance to grow. So lactate is only available energy source. Lactate fermentation, we are propionate pathway. Now it produces acetate and carbon dioxide, and end product again varies, depends on what microorganism or what bacteria that we are dealing with. Okay. Now, I want to talk about starter cultures. Now, as I've mentioned, 
There are instances where we can control fermentation and there are instances where we cannot control fermentation. So those instances where we cannot control fermentation are where fermentation occurs naturally. One example is the production of soy sauce. Soy sauce is very frequently here in Malaysia produced in uh, small medium industries or maybe traditional what we call cottage industries. So what happens is that they will have a fermentation ba barrel. This is uh, day one fermentation and then they would need to have subsequent batches of fermentation, right? They will take one sample from today's fermentation and add into a new medium and then whatever microorganism inside will continue fermentation. Then from there they'll take again to the next day. So they continuously do that, but they do not know actually what microorganisms are inside. They just know that that pool of microorganism works. So that is the uh, traditional, or what we call cottage industries. A lot of industries happen that way. Uh, also in Northern Malaysia, very famous is the uh, Nipah, Nipah beverage, right? Nira, Nipah Nira, uh, acetic acid, right? Is it acetic acid? I believe it is. Uh, sourish. So that is also the same thing. When we, call, when we talk about control fermentation, then we're talking about we need to add cultures inside fermentation for fermentation to occur. And whatever that we are adding inside, we know what they are, what microorganisms, and we know at what concentration. So we can control the fermentation. So for soy, soy sauce making, for example, it's still control. They still know the temperature and all that but they would know what microorganism. Now think of it this way, if we were to have a very standardized quality of soy sauce, can we do that for the uncontrolled cottage fermentation? It's very hard, very hard to ensure that fermentation today and the fermentation next year is going to be exactly the same. We cannot be sure of that. But if we add in microorganisms for fermentation, then we can be sure that we can control the environment, we can control the strains and control the concentration. Okay? So when we add certain microorganisms inside fermentation, that's what we say we are adding in starter cultures. Okay? So products can be made without microbes, bread, soy sauce, not without microbes, without additioning, addition of new microbes, sour cream and so on. But uh, these are some of the problems that we can face. Lack of desired organoleptic properties because we cannot quite control it. So if something happens during that fermentation, something wrong happens and the entire organoleptic property is modified, there's nothing much we could do because we don't actually know what microorganisms are there to control in the first place. And then microbes responsible for producing metabolic end products and textural modifications are not known. We only know, yeah, that they, they work. And replicate, impossible. We cannot reproduce exactly the same thing tomorrow or next year. We can just continuously produce, hopefully that whatever culture that we add in is the same. So rely on indigenous microorganisms. Indigenous microorganism meaning microorganisms that already uh, exist in the raw material. So for example, for wine uh, fermentation, the raw material is grapes. Grape already has indigenous uh, yeast. So sometimes if, even if we don't add it in, but under a very suitable or optimal conditions, we can still have wine or, or alcoholic beverages fermentation. All right? But if you want to control that, then you will have to add in new ones. Uh, meat. Meat will have a lot of microorganisms. There are also a lot of cottage industries producing fermented sausages. So they will just uh, stuff the uh, meat into the casing, keep it under certain conditions, and after that, it will ferment on their own and it will be fermented sausages. Okay? Grapes and equipment in ETC. Some of the microorganisms can also come from equipment. One example is dade. Dade is a fermented yogurt. I think a lot produced in Indonesia. We have it in Malaysia too, but I think in Indonesia it's uh, larger. So what happens in um, Indonesia is that they don't use certain mold, uh, they don't use certain, for example, stainless steel industrial mold for dade. They pour in milk into, let's say, bamboo. 
and then just leave it for fermentation. So where would the microorganism come from? Yes, the microorganism can come from the milk itself if the milk is not pasteurized and uh, the bamboo itself. So how to control? We have to have make sure the uh, same bamboo from the same plantation, but even same plantation, different seasons, different times of the year, they will also have different microorganism profile. Okay, so that can happen from the source itself or from the equipment. So the bamboo is the equipment. Now, a, start, a starter culture means a portion, um, okay, this is back on, uh, not starter culture yet, this is back on the uh, cottage industry. So what happened is that a portion of successful fermentation, like I said just now, take a portion and inoculate into the next batch. And then this fermentation is successful, take a portion again and inoculate into the next batch. You can actually use this kind of method to produce your own yogurt. A lot of us actually produce yogurt at home. What do you do? You can buy commercial yogurt, take a tub, pour it into a uh, evil ferment, and you will have your whole new batch of yogurt. But do you know what is inside? You will know what's inside. But if you have from commercial source, then you can see on the label. Uh, what bacteria, what bacteria, what bacteria, all right? So vinegar, sour bread, and so on. Now, starter culture is when we add a defined amount of cultures into the fermentation. So fermentation, spoilage by microbes, uh, we can reduce that. Because whatever that we are adding in, we know the concentration. And if we add it at a higher concentration, then we will be rather sure that it will be dominant for that fermentation. So it can outcompete other indigenous microorganisms in the initial substrate. For example, in milk, if we pasteurize milk, then it's okay. All microorganisms inside can be inhibited. But if we do not pasteurize milk, raw milk, now milk, uh, before coming out from the mammalian body, is sterilized, sterile. Once it comes out and exposed to the environment, exposed to the farm environment, uh, exposed to the cow skin, then obviously it's no longer sterile. It can pick up a lot of microorganisms throughout the way. So from the farm to the vendor, from the vendor to you, to us, a lot of things can happen. So if we don't pasteurize the milk, there will be a lot of microorganisms inside milk. So if we pasteurize that, then it's all killed. Now, once we add in, let's say, an inoculum, a starter culture, at a high concentration. So that will have a higher concentration than whatever that we have inside the milk. And it will compete with this other micro, indigenous microorganism and they will grow better. These uh, starter cultures that we add in normally are the ones that are well defined. We have experimented on it. We know its growth profile. We know its growth properties. All right. So purified cultures re-inoculated into fresh raw material. So we don't just take a scoop and add into the new, new milk. Purified culture means we know what cultures they are in pure form already. We isolate and regrow them. Okay. So rows of starter cultures, we inoculate into food materials to overwhelm the existing flora. Overwhelm meaning to outcompete the existing flora. So the numbers are higher than the existing flora. And they establish desired changes. Because we know their growth properties, we know what metabolites they produce, so we know uh, what kind of functions they might have. So sometimes we can have a lot of novelty in, the product, in product development. Enhanced preservation because we know what kind of acids are produced, what metabolites, uh, nutrients, unavailability. So we know if milk has certain nutrients that are unavailable to these microbes that we're adding in, we can add in the nutrients so we can control the fermentation condition. Reduce food safety issues. Now we know what we are adding in. We know we can control the fermentation process. It will be less likable that uh, contamination would occur. Contamination will still occur, but most probably at a much, much lower percentage. So we have less food safety issues, uh, sensory qualities, economic values, and so on. Okay, certain products still use natural fermentation, even for commercial production. Depending on how big, sauerkraut, export business, kimchi, huge, uh, nira, 
Nipah Nira also all the way to throughout Malaysia and even our cottage traditional industries for tempeh and, and uh, yeah, soy sauce, they are also uh, some exported. So those can still go on. Now, most of these manufacturers, they will maintain their own starter culture. They have to take care. Otherwise, it will really be impossible to reproduce every batch. Okay. Okay, some of the important bacterial starter cultures very commonly used. Now think of the common food fermentation. It will be lactic acid, acetic acid, alcohol. So most of these starter cultures that are important to these are widely available. So we have the lactobacillus, we have the acetobacter, we have the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast. So dairy, as you can see, dairy lactic acid bacteria is one of the largest because dairy industry is huge and uh, mesophilic and thermophilic. Mesophilic are the ones that are grown at room temperature. Thermophilic are the ones that can tolerate very high temperature. Are also available, such as uh, uh, esthermophilus for cheddar cheeses, uh, l lactase for mozzarella cheeses. Okay, and so on. This one I won't cover. Okay, now before I go on and continue into uh, yeast starter cultures, any questions? Yes. Hopefully they have a good Q&A system, uh, so QC system, QAQC system, to actually check for final fermented product quality. For controlled fermentation, it's easier because we add in. We know what bacteria we are adding in. The Nigerian one is a cottage traditional fermentation industries. If we know what we are adding in, we know, for example, lactic acid bacteria in milk fermentation, we know their profile. They are going to con uh, convert lactose to lactic acid, acetic acid, carbon dioxide, diacetyl, hydrogen peroxide. The profile of the metabolites are already very well defined. So for QAQC, it makes life very easy for them because all they need to know right now is just to check for um, certain parameters for safety. But for traditional, there are so many parameters of safety to cover because we really do not know what's going to happen. So for safety, uh, per, from the safety perspective, starter cultures are very important. So if you want to, is, is there a method to check? Yes, depending on your product. So products that are very high, uh, high in toxicity, for example, nuts, uh, contamination can occur, then aflatoxin can be accumulated. You know those nuts that we eat every day, we just eat, right? Actually, many of those would actually have accumulated aflatoxin. So we don't know about that. So if we are exporting that, one of the main criteria is to check for aflatoxin content. So depending on the product and depending on what fermentation go that, that goes on. All right. I want to show you a video of uh, the indigenous microorganism inside, right? Yes. Uh, OK, for example, if certain substrate, initial substrate, can be heat treated, that would be easier. Because once you go through heat treatment, then the uh, indigenous microflora are gone. But we have to make sure that the heat treatment does not change the organoleptic of the food material itself. So I think if you read on sauerkraut or wine, I have that. So for wine especially, uh, it uses sulfur, uh, sulfite treatment because they don't want to use heat treatment. They don't want to kill off the organoleptic properties of wine. So read on that. Now, for example, for milk, milk can be pasteurized. So it, uh, it, it, yes, yes. So it eliminates a lot of the uh, microorganism. I hope you can hear this. Uh, I hope the sound is okay. This is a very short video. to do this yeah.
satu. Ya plug ya. Wait, I'll let you try. I think we start again ya. Then I have another one. Any question on beer? I can upload this on Elon. Okay. Another one is cheese making.
cheese by cleaning the tank and pouring the milk. Days off. Then came steaming the milk, heat it up, and the wait. At this point in the cheese making process, we wait for the milk to reach exactly 70 degrees Fahrenheit. During this critical time, there is virtually nothing to do. We have good help for us, the moles. Do you have any jobs in it? No. I'll pass on. Well, according to the thermometer, the milk is now 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which means we need to... We need to add the culture to it. What is the culture, exactly? It's called lactobacillus. It actually creates lactic acid. It will slowly raise the acid level of the milk. Now, this is enough culture to satisfy 4,000 pounds? This will actually be 5,000 pounds, a little bit extra, it's not a bad thing. But it's poured straight in, or? Poured straight down to the, the, the length of that. I don't know the length, all right. There we go. So now we're just basically yeah. mixing the yeah. culture? Yes. I've never raked milk before. Awesome. The perfect store. Whoops. <laughs>
half pounders, right? And the moles weigh three pounds, right? And then we're gonna put three pounds of third in the moles as well. So we're basically going for a six pound weight right here. And this thing weight and cheese, I need to keep separating the third. Otherwise, we're going to bring in giant clumps, and then Mark or Ken or Cindy or somebody is going to give me a hard time about it. I'll just have to work twice a month. The final stage of cheese making involves this steam press, which will squeeze the remaining liquid out of 87 two and a half pound meals, three 40 pound molds, and one 25 pound mold. It's a lot of cheese, three thousand dollars worth to be exact. These are dummies, empty ones, to create the necessary dynamic tension in the press. Come now, turn the lever on the press. Okay, as you can see, for cheeses, uh, that's traditional, but still they added starter culture in, right? And you notice why they want to wax it? To cover it, right? So they don't want to have mold problems. And they're producing cheddar cheeses. Cheddar cheeses minimum, minimum, nine months incubation. All the bacteria inside will produce the flavor. Um, I know, because I was involved in one cheddar cheese production project last time. And every month, we would do sensory. And every month, the sensory and organoleptic properties will change. So initially, you just basically taste milk with salt. Later on, you will feel the, uh, the, um, yeah, the taste of it. Uh, it's different. I don't know how to describe it, but it's different. And uh, nine months, the longer, the better, actually. The longer, the more flavor is going to come out. All right. So that's why they will really have to wax it to cover it so they don't well, hopefully they don't have more contamination. And did you see them putting in rennet just now? 
Uh, we will talk about rennet in enzymes later. Rennet is an enzyme. It actually causes the milk protein to curd. So that was why uh, it was added, it, uh, added in. And before that, they actually had to wait for the uh, milk to reach certain temperature. That was because they had to pasteurize the milk, then added sata culture in again and waited uh, for some temperature. That was for the sata culture to be activated. Then after that, they added in rennet and the uh, uh, curdling process and so on. Then they drain out the whey, right? Actually, the whey is very nutritious. The whey has a lot of proteins, and that whey alone can also be a substrate to a lot of back, for a lot of bacteria to grow. And because they have a lot of proteins inside, and once the bacteria, whatever additional bacteria that we grow inside the whey, the bacteria can also hydrolyze the protein and produce a lot of peptides. And many of these peptides have uh, antihypertensive effects, reducing hypertension. So we call those bioactive peptides. So as you can see, the potential for bioprocess technology, food bioprocess technology, is huge. Not just the production of the product, whatever byproduct that we think is a waste, is a byproduct, it's actually not a waste. It can still be used for a lot of health properties. So that's why research is still going on, and that's what research is all about. OK, we continue with some yeast starter cultures, all right? So we've talked about all these bacteria starter cultures and so on. Yes? The what? Paraffin. Paraffin. Wax. Paraffin. Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. But paraffin is very commonly used in uh, pharmaceutical application. Sometimes, um, sometimes when we have such a certain itchiness, we see a doctor. Doctor give us some cream, and it's a yellowish, waxy in color. That is also paraffin. Not the white, not the white milky lotion. Uh the uh, yellowish, tr a bit transparent looking, sticky cream. That's paraffin. Okay. Edible, I have to check on that. I am not too sure. Yeah, but that wax can be removed. It's the, it hardens. After that, you can just peel it off. Yeah. I don't think we eat that wax. No, just peel it off. Okay, now. Let me have a look at this. Huh? Okay, just two more slides. Bear with me for a while before I go on to single cell protein. It's already 11.30. I didn't even know that. Yes. Cheese. Uh, that one may not be paraffin. That may, many of our fruits are actually protein biofilms. Those are edible. Huh. Just like um, there are some kind of sweets that I ate when I was a li little girl. You don't have to peel off the, the thing. Just pop the whole thing in. It will melt. Uh, that is not wax. Uh, that one, I don't know if it's polysaccharide or protein. But many of uh, the uh, fruits, the apples that we are getting in, they are protein par uh, films. Protein films. This wax, I don't think so. Yes, yes, that's edible, edible wax. Yeah. Can. <laughs> Can. Even if you wash, it won't come out sometimes. Okay, any other questions before I go on? Can your last till 12 o'clock or feel sleepy already? <laughs> I was hoping to go into single cell protein. Okay, never mind. I'll go. Because when I check the schedule, we actually have time. So not much worry. I will try to cover as many lectures as possible rather than you reading it alone. Okay, two more slides. Yeast starter culture. So we have all the bacteria starter culture for uh, milk fermentation, cheese fermentation, the, uh, cheese production. Now we have yeast starter cultures. Okay, bread manufacturers use the largest amount of yeast. And as covered in the earlier lectures for Malaysia, because when we add yeast starter culture in bread making, the yeast remains in the bread. It is not like we use the yeast for fermentation, after that we remove the yeast. 
All right, so yeast is inside the bread, and when we eat bread, we're going to consume the yeast together. So for Malaysia, according to our Food Act 1985, we can only have two types of yeast if we were to consume the whole cells. That is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Candida utilis. So only these two. And most of the time, most of our baker's yeast are actually Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And several forms, moist yeast cakes, active dry yeast packages, and so on. I will touch more on this in single cell protein later. So they produce large amount of carbon dioxide. Some of them can instantly be activated, some of them cannot. But all these fall under single cell protein. So we, we will touch about that later. And uh, fermented alcoholic beverage also use yeast cultures. And uh, they have different characteristics, although all belong to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, we are talking about one genus, one species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. As bioprocess students, I hope you would know that genus species must be italized. If you cannot have them italized, like when you're writing, then it must be underlined. Genus must always have a capital letter. Species, small letter. So don't get these confused. And when you're writing, make sure you have those underlined. When you're typing, make sure they are italized. Okay? Now, we're talking about one genus, one species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and we think that they are the same. But bear in mind, there are I would say hundreds types of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It can be Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain 1, Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain 2, and all different types of codes. If we were to check them for genomic makeup, they will be different. And because of that, they would have different characteristics. But because they share the same genus species, certain general characteristics are almost similar. So we are using it for fermentation. We have got to be very careful. Different strains can have sometimes have very different characteristics and they can give a very different uh, organoleptic profile for the end food products, okay? Then we have most of the cultures, that is for example in cheese. The cheese that we saw in the video just now, it was kept in paraffin because they don't want mold contamination. But certain cheeses want mold. That's what we call moldy cheese. I have tried moldy cheese. Personally, there are certain ones that I cannot tolerate like the blue vein cheese. You see cheese and you, they, they are bluish in color, are looking like veins, that's why it's called blue vein cheese. So it's because of uh, a, a fungus, a, fun, uh, a mold growing on it. And it's purposely done that way because they want to produce moldy cheese. And still fermentation still have to go on. You still have to have your mold inside and wait for it to ferment. But the characteristic, uh, the organoleptic characteristic is very different compared to, for example, cheddar cheeses just now that was produced by bacteria. But depending on culture and tradition, some people can accept it, of course, they love it, and they eat it with cookies. For us, we like maybe tampoya. Many other people will definitely not like tampoya. So depending on culture and region and tradition, okay? So certain traditions like that. Now, blue mold cheeses, uh, they are made from this uh, mold, Penicillium roccotti or Penicillium camemberti. That's why we have camemberti cheese, all right, from, from the name of the bacteria. And of course, we have soy derived fermented foods as well. That, that these are more famous in Asian region. Uh, tempeh from the mold rhizopus, natto, uh, natto from bacteria, and uh, soy sauce, miso, aspergillus, and so on. Okay, so those are all. Uh, Molds, mold fermentation, mold starter culture. Okay, that ends my lecture today. We will go. We will continue with the Q and A then. Okay.